pleased to introduce uh, the Information Security Officer and a Professor in the Sociology and Computer Science Department at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, he's the author of two books on computer criminology and forensics due to uh, be published next fall. His name is Chad Johnson. Everybody, please give him a warm welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you all very much for joining me today. Uh, yes, I'm Chad Johnson. I am a professor of sociology and computer science at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about just a couple of the high level theories that I discussed in some of my earlier courses. Uh, being a professor in both departments, I do have an opportunity to uh, teach occasionally blended classes where half of my students will be sociology students and half of them will be computer science students. Uh, the theme of uh, lockdown 2019 is living in a cyber world and by any objective measure of a society we're definitely there and we have been for quite some time. So you might think that uh, a blended course wouldn't be that big of a deal for these students but what I often find uh, that my sociology students will react to technical topics with fear um, or they're intensely bored by technology. Whereas my uh, computer science students may be skeptical of social science or intensely bored by that topic as well. Um, so I'm hoping uh, that uh, this is not going to be the case here. If, uh, if you're at this conference, presumably you've chosen a profession that fairly well blends the two. Uh, but what you may not be cognizant of these theories and how they can be applied uh, to help you inform your security strategy and do appropriate risk-based analysis. Now, even though we are objectively living in a cyber world, that doesn't necessarily mean that all aspects of our society have caught up to that fact. And uh, one of the classic ways that we tend to lag behind, or one of the places we tend to lag behind, is in our, our justice system. Um, so one of the places where that is meted out, there we go, um, most starkly, um, to illustrate that point, rather, is by introducing first the concept of a horse law. So a horse law is essentially extending old modalities to cover new legal situations for which we had no previous um, conceivable uh, way of identifying. So a good way to explain that, and this is certainly not a new thing. Um, the Internet, of course, changed everything, um, and we have a number of horse laws that extend over the Internet, but it's a fairly old concept, and the name itself comes from earlier in our history when the primary means of conveyance for most people was the horse-drawn carriage. Of course, that being the case, there were a number of laws that were written in order to govern the use of horse-drawn conveyances. And one of those would be, for example, the necessity for every horse-drawn carriage to have a buggy whip holder in order to manage it, prevent it from falling and hitting the spokes or a bystander. Now, of course, then we had a technological advancement, and no longer was the horse-drawn carriage the primary means of conveyance. There was a transitionary period to the horseless carriage. However, the legal situation, uh, the legal system, rather, taking time to catch up to technological advances, still applied those old horse laws to the horseless carriage. And so despite the fact that there was no animal attached to it, it was still a requirement for some time in a lot of jurisdictions to have a buggy whip holder on your horseless carriage. Um, this happens even still today, and it's actually meted out in our nomenclature. We, of course, refer to data on a computer system as files. And there are many legal cases that identify a computer system for the purposes of the Fourth Amendment search and seizure cases to be considered either a closed container or a file cabinet. I don't have to tell anybody here that stretching that analogy doesn't go very far when you're talking about an actual computer system. We see the same thing with these theories. Crime, of course, has been around since uh, the beginning of our history, and there have been a number of theories that were developed prior to the advancement of our modern communication systems um, that, for one reason or another, we uh, have difficulty stretching uh, to cover these new situations. There are some, however, that aren't, that do apply very well, and there have been a number of them that have been advanced since then, which I'd like to talk about. I'm going to focus on four today. There are uh, dozens and dozens of criminological theories that could apply to these new situations, but uh, for the purposes of brevity, we'll focus on just the four. Uh, first, we'll talk about space transition theory, which is a behavior that explains the disparity between an individual's behavior online and offline. Routine activities theory, which uh, posits that you can prevent crime by identifying loci where they may be created, which applies very well to many online activities, many computer crimes. And next, broken windows theory, which explains how entropy can create disorder and lead to crime. 
and general strain theory, uh, which would be what, uh, explaining what pushes somebody to engage in criminal coping or antisocial behavior. Uh, anyone here with a criminal justice background or works within the justice system, you probably have a, a good uh, reckoning of these uh, theories as they are now. I'm going to present them today in a reductive sense, just uh, in order to uh, create greater understanding. Just be aware of that, I guess, if you're familiar with them. So what makes implying theory difficult to crime when it's a uh, computer crime? Uh, well, there are four essential elements of modern technology and mass communication that tend to frustrate that process, tend to frustrate investigations, and to exacerbate the impact of crimes. And these four essential elements are essentially what makes it difficult for us to identify criminal uh, behavior uh, and to uh, identify behavior across, from, it bleeds from the real world into uh, the internet, for example. And those four are, first of all, anonymity, so there's, of course, a certain amount of identity flexibility on the Internet. Of course, our keynote speaker uh, mentioned that it's become increasingly more difficult. Uh, anonymity has become more of a perceived anonymity than anything else. However, in terms of our identities online, we are still in a place where we can self-select our associations and our representation. Essentially, people know about us by what we put out there. Uh, this can be frustrating for an investigation, obviously. It can be difficult to identify individuals when they're... Uh, they're obfuscating their, their personality and their identity. Uh, it can also be a boon, as we'll talk about in a moment, to certain computer criminals of certain types because it gives them a greater opportunity uh, to find victims and manipulate them. Uh, constant connectivity. There's nobody in this room right now that's probably more than five feet away from a computer that has access to the internet. Um, it's everywhere these days. All of us have a cell phone, a computer. Some of us have multiple such devices on us at any given time. Uh, that can be very frustrating when it comes to an investigation. It can also be a benefit because we are talking then about an abundance of potential evidence with all the devices that are out there. But it can be frustrating because then we reach a point where there is a volume of data to go through that's simply, uh, it's just not practical to go through in the time period of an investigation. Uh, next is permanence, which is most troubling uh, when it comes to the exacerbation of the impact of a crime, particularly with child exploitation cases where we'll see um, in modern exploitation cases where an individual doesn't just feel victimized by the event, but feels continually victimized knowing that their data is out there somewhere and someone is viewing it at any given moment. And finally, depersonalization, which goes hand in hand with anonymity. Uh, we uh, are able to choose our own identities online, but we also interact with people in a way where all we really have a sense of them by is their screen name, maybe a couple photos, and the text that they create. Um, there have been plenty of sociological and psychological studies that have shown that it is very easy to dehumanize people in this situation, making it much easier to disregard their feelings, to victimize them in the event of a crime. Essentially, they're never really quite real to us. So the first theory I'd like to talk about is space transition theory. Uh, essentially, what this posits is that a person uh, with repressed criminal behavior may act differently um, when they're uh, able to insulate themselves from their actual identity. So essentially we have individuals uh, who maybe have a propensity for criminal behavior who don't act on that in the real world due to the social consequences, uh, but when removed from those situations uh, will act out on those impulses. Um, part of the explanation for this is that there is a, certainly a conflict of norms between what's acceptable in real world interactions and what's acceptable online. Um, I mean, all you have to do is go on there for five minutes and uh, go ahead and put a post anywhere and guaranteed you'll be insulted by somebody within moments, right? That's the internet. Uh, whereas doing something like that in person would, would be unacceptable. Um, here the uh, concepts of identity flexibility and disassociative anonymity come into strong play. Uh, it's just that there's a lack of a deterrence factor. There are social consequences for your actions when your identity is associated with, uh, with, your, with your actions. Um, when that's not the case, when there are no consequences, uh, that's when people will act out. They have the opportunity to act out on those impulses. Uh, or essentially, you, you'll get a sense of a person's true personality when they are removed from all consequences for their behavior. This is particularly when we're talking about uh, malevolent personality traits uh, known as the dark tetrad, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but these dark tetrad traits can be suppressed in real life. So somebody who has a propensity for criminal behavior uh, they don't act out on them in the real world because maybe they've been socialized to suppress those urges. So somebody who feels a callous disregard for other people's feelings 
through the process of their parents, their friends, and all that kind of thing, will we'll eventually learn to suppress those because the social consequences are too great. Um, so let's talk about that dark tetrad. Now, a couple of the terms that you're going to see here are likely to be familiar with you uh, through pop culture. They may be familiar to you uh, as um, mental illness diagnoses, rather, of mental illness. I would like to point out before we start talking about these that the DSM has abandoned the use of terms like psychopathy and sociopathy. Um, right now, they are classified as cluster B personality disorders, and there are diagnostic criteria for them. This is not that. Uh, this is a sociological theory. So what we're talking about here when we're talking about the dark tetrad are um, essentially organizing different behaviors into different categories, behaviors of a similar stripe. Um, so when we talk about psychopathy, we may be talking about uh, the cluster B personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. They may share certain traits, but these are not diagnostic criteria. They're just ways of organizing, for lack of a better word, human cruelty or evil or what have you. Essentially, as sociologists, we would consider these predatory behaviors. So first we have psychopathy, which is a callous disregard for uh, other people, a sort of malevolent ins insensitivity. Um, we see this uh, a lot on, online. Again, this the concept of depersonalization comes into play. People aren't quite real, and although somebody with these dark tetrad traits that may carry over into their real life, they can certainly express that online much easier because they are even less real to them. With narcissism, uh, again, not narcissistic personality disorder. We are talking about just the behavior of narcissism. Uh, social media, of course, we're not talking about mere vanity here. We do see plenty of that online. Social media provides an outlet for that kind of thing all the time. We see it everywhere. But what we're actually talking about here is a malevolent, a malignant narcissism. And social media provides those individuals with predatory be uh, narcissistic behaviors an opportunity to have unprecedented access to their victims. With Machiavellianism, we're talking about essentially a disregard uh, for other people for the advancement of their own agendas. Um, identity flexibility gives uh, uh, people with uh, dark tetrad traits and Machiavellianism uh, fantastic opportunities to victimize other people because it allows them to adopt many different personalities, many different personas, all at the same time, making it more easy for them to manipulate people. What we're talking about with Machiavellianism isn't necessarily a... Uh, uh, that they're very good at manipulating people. What we're talking about are individuals that uh, have certain markers when it comes to uh, pragmatism and manipulation, where they see it as a means to an end where it's acceptable. Uh, perhaps the most malevolent of the dark tetrad traits, especially when in conjunction with one of the others, is sadism. And this is expressed all the time online. What we're talking about here are individuals uh, who essentially get a rise out of hurting other people in some fashion. So somebody who happens to enjoy hurting people but also disregards their feelings or has narcissistic personality traits or Machiavellian personality traits, uh, certainly much more destructive than somebody who is not. Uh, most often online, this is expressed actually with, um, with the concept of what's known as casual sadism or everyday sadism, which explains things, for example, like internet trolls. So people who have sadistic personality traits in real life who suppress them uh, due to the social consequences, they feel frustrated by that. And so they're able to go, maybe they're frustrated at work, uh, they're unable to express those feelings, so they come home, they go on Xbox Live, play Call of Duty, and start hurling racial epithets at a 12-year-old. Everyday sadism. Um, the easiest way, I guess, to, uh, to identify the dark tetrad traits is to say that psychopathy is uh, people who would be willing to hurt other people because they simply don't register on their, uh, on their radar as having feelings as being other people. Narcissism, hurting other people, in order to reflect upon them, in order to gain some sort of intrinsically valuable um, reward. Machiavellianism, hurting other people in order to advance their own agenda, or sadism, hurting other people because they enjoy it. So how can we apply space transition theory in order to inform our, our risk, our, our security strategy? Well, most importantly is to keep in mind that a person's behavior offline doesn't necessarily equate to their online behavior. There have been plenty of instances where an individual um, seems to be very congenial and very, very nice in real life, but uh, then will turn around and their behavior online is a stark contrast to that. Um, the concept of uh, trust but verify comes to mind. Um, next, uh, in your environment, maintaining identity uh, or accountability rather is critical. Identity flexibility is one of the primary tools that people with predatory traits will take advantage of in the online space. 
So removing the most opportunities where accountability can be issued is, is critical. Uh, next, uh, and this is, speaks more to the future of the industry than anything else, is that it does appear to be possible to associate a person's behavior with some of these traits. Um, for example, you can use things like stylometry, behavioral attribution, uh, habit attribution, uh, behavioral analytics, which we will mostly know at this point, point in time, rather, being used for marketing purposes, can be used and can be leveraged to identify personality traits in individuals by their behavior. We see this in uh, Kotika Laputi, 2012, wherein there was a study of a, a college campus. Uh, students' net flow data was correlated with uh, self-submitted uh, personality uh, inventories and found that people who have depression tend to use technology differently than those who aren't, spending less time on a page, being more listless and uh, unpointed in their, in their surfing habits. Implications there being that it is maybe possible, rather, to use this to maybe reach out to individuals who are in need of assistance rather than having to ask them to seek it out themselves. We can also use this potentially in order to examine dark tetrad traits. There was Carpenter in 2016, which was able to identify dark tetrad traits in individuals based upon their Twitter usage and their submissions. So as far as the implications for the future of this industry, currently, of course, a lot of our uh, security systems rely upon signatures, uh, attacking from a technical perspective. But there may be a future coming where instead our intrusion detection systems are based upon detecting user intent. Uh, next, routine activities theory. This is a simple theory, uh, essentially. Again, identifying that, the crim uh, that crimes can be prevented by identifying loci, and the loci are where these three elements coincide. So in order for a crime to occur anywhere offline or on, these three elements must be in the same place at the same time in order for a crime to occur. And those are a motivated offender, a suitable victim, and the absence of a capable guardian. So our motivated offender in terms of computer crime, the application of the traditional motive, means, opportunity, identification of a modus operandi, and any present signature still applies. Computer criminals, as with traditional offline criminals, all have these traits. Um, a motivated offender, uh, as far as computer crimes go, is uh, not only going to be somebody who is in the right place at the right time, who has a motive, means, and opportunity to commit the crime, but we're also looking at an individual who has the te technical capability to do so. Um, with computer crime, uh, computer criminals rather, a lot of their work can be automated. So I'm sure everybody in here at your organization, just as mine, are scanned regularly uh, day in, day out, uh, computer criminals who happen to be seeking a target of opportunity, which is something that uh, traditional criminals, or traditional crimes rather, don't, that's not an element that they have to take into consideration. So a motivated offender may not necessarily have selected a target, uh, they may merely be trawling for that low-hanging fruit. Another thing that we see with computer criminals that differs slightly from traditional criminals is that they are more likely to be motivated by targets of intrinsic value. So extrinsic value, of course, is something that has an objective value attached to it, so money, diamonds, gems, electronics, something that can be sold that objectively has a value. Uh, targets of intrinsic value, rather, don't provide necessarily a monetary reward for the offender, but rather are selected because it's challenging or because it's just because it's difficult or because, in the case of hacktivism, they're a, a uniquely attractive target. Uh, with offline crimes, what we see, uh, we'll see this in, for example, crimes of passion, and also everyone here I'm sure is familiar with, uh, with the concept of crimes in self-defense, but what, we're, what we would see as far as an intrinsically valuable crime are actually known as crimes in defense of the self. So crimes that uh, for one reason or another strike the, uh, the offender at their, the core of their identity to the point where the principal uh, begins to outweigh things that are objectively more important like family or their freedom, and so they commit the crime to right that wrong to regain a sense of their identity. We do see that with computer crime too, but for even, uh, even more um, illusory reasons, selecting victims because they, because they are who they are, because they are challenging. A capable guardian, presumably in one capacity or another, uh, pretty much accounts for everybody in this room, I think. Um, but uh, So we're talking about a person or a thing that has been put in place to deter a motivated offender from victimizing a suitable target. Um, and in our case, with computer systems, we're talking about security controls, both technical, administrative, any security control that can be put in place. To liken it to a, uh, a physical location, 
um, not necessarily just the presence of police or security guards. We're all talking about here uh, also no trespassing signs would be the projection of a capable guardian. Um, a padlock on a door is the projection of a capable guardian. Um, again, stretching that analogy sort of falls apart with computer systems because if we try to liken that to a physical place, then it would be essentially be a physical place that has a limitless number of doors, not all of which we necessarily know about. Um, and it's, it's more difficult than to identify where uh, a capable guardian must be projected to prevent a crime. Uh, next, we have the suitable victim. So a suitable victim, again, is maybe somebody who is identified as low-hanging fruit, maybe through automated scanning or even a manual uh, search from an offender, uh, just looking for known vulnerabilities. However, a suitable victim in a computer crime sense may also be what's known as a uniquely attractive target. So it could be an individual uh, or an organization, rather, um, that for one reason or another is intentionally selected by the motivated offender. In either case, um, these, uh, both of these situations are going to exist. They're going to be out there. Um, now, everyone in here, of course, you probably deal with, uh, with end users. Uh, keep in mind that one of the most common correlates with being the victim in computer crime is engaging in what's known as deviant cyber behavior, whether that's criminal behavior or not. And following routine activities, this can be explained by the fact that the suitable victim is intentionally eschewing the capable guardian in order to engage in that deviant behavior. It's deviant because the capable guardian wouldn't approve of it. One of the technical controls may even prevent it. This already puts two of the three legs in routine activities theory in the same place at the same time. And then a motivated offender at the right opportunity can come in and take advantage of that. So if you can honestly say that your users aren't engaging in any deviant behavior, I would appreciate knowing how you do that. So we can choose pretty much any example of a data breach here um, in order to uh, describe routine activities theory, but I just happen to be doing research unrelated to this conference on the Panama Papers recently, so uh, let's use that one. So in order to identify our three legs, we take a look at the, the crime itself. So first, our suitable victim. So we have Masak Fonseca, Masak Fonseca Panamanian law firm. Uh, of course, they had uh, thousands of clients, very powerful clients, uh, that, uh, kind of a, not necessarily a well-kept secret, I guess, uh, among certain circles. Um, they had been, even prior to the data breach, investigated for money laundering. Um, they had tons of documents going back decades. So all of this makes them a, a uniquely attractive target to a hacktivist. Uh, but as we saw, they also had public-facing systems, which of course are being scanned, so that makes them a suitable target as, uh, for a motivated offender just kind of looking for a target of opportunity. Our motivated offender is an anonymous individual. Um, they may come upon that confidential data in the course of their attack. Uh, they realize that it has very low extrinsic value. This is, I mean, it's information that they're just as likely to you know, be killed for rather than be paid for. So extortion is not necessarily a crime considering uh, the victims. Um, but it has a very high intrinsic value. And so we have our motivated offender making a rational choice. In terms of the apparent absence of a capable guardian, there were plenty of signs for our motivated offender that this was the case. Their Outlook web application hadn't been patched since 2009. Their CMS uh, Drupal hadn't, was open to more than 20 known CVEs. Um, but in addition to that, we also have, uh, for example, uh, the fact that their email archives weren't encrypted signals the absence of a capable guardian. The fact that their document naming convention was fuscable is the absence, uh, sorry, the projection of the absence of a capable guardian. So our lessons from routine activities is, well, essentially you cannot uh, necessarily prevent the existence of a motivated offender. We have to consider that to be outside of our control. Um, Motivated offenders are scanning everything all the time. Anything that they can find, they're going to be out there. We can't stop them from looking. We cannot control whether or not our organization is a uniquely attractive target. We can't control whether or not we're handling particularly valuable sensitive data. We can't control whether or not our organizations are in the news necessarily. Uh, but what we can control is our environment. So um, my mentor into the world of information security has a saying, many sayings, but in this case, uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And there have been many cases in my career where I have been faced with a security initiative that I knew not to be a perfect solution, but I knew would cover certain situations. And of course, the argument that often comes back is, well, you know, what about these particular situations? This doesn't cover this, why bother? Uh, well, what routine activities theory teaches us is essentially that any interaction where we have a motivated offender with a suitable victim 
Uh, if we can project our presence of a capable guardian, we can reduce the likelihood of a crime being committed there. So doing something is better than nothing. Um, which, second, uh, your organization should make an effort to project that presence of a capable guardian at every possible opportunity. And we're not just talking about making sure that your security systems are tuned, that you have the latest signatures. All of that, of course, is something that you should do. But take a look at your, um, your organization from an outsider perspective, from an attacker perspective. We're not talking about just an external pen test here. That's a, that's a pen test scenario. Look at it, or hire somebody to look at it, like a criminal. So for example, if you publicly publish your policy, procedures, and standards documents, and those documents contain a date, update them frequently, even if there aren't that many changes. An attacker who's trawling in a recon phase, we're talking, of course, this, when we're talking about the interaction of a, a motivated offender and the suitable victim, think the attack kill chain, right? So during that recon phase, they're gonna be looking at your security policies, or they're likely to. If they see that that date has been updated, that projects the presence of capable guardians. Somebody is caring about these topics. Uh, and last, risk assessments should um, consider the intrinsic value of your organization. So over the time that I've been working in security, I've noticed that risk assessments have become more and more like insurance adjustments, uh, thinking about dollar values. And of course, all of that's very important, your AORs and such. So the dollar value, for example, of your data center is, is critically important to your operations. But um, it's not the only consideration, and it shouldn't be. And a lot of security frameworks, like NIST, don't necessarily take intrinsic value into account, doesn't take things like victimology into account. Um, so take a look at your organization, again, from an outsider perspective of a criminal, and say, well, even if I can't get to the items of extrinsic value, if I can't get to the data that I can sell, what could I do to embarrass this target? And of course, that may be as part of a greater uh, attack to distract you from their actual objective. So uh, taking, for example, the Sony hack. Um, so there are, of course, the, uh, the leak of the, uh, what was the Game of Thrones season six or seven, whatever it was. Uh, that would be an item of extrinsic value. That could certainly be sold. It was released before it was meant to be. That's valuable data. That's high extrinsic value. But the emails had high intrinsic value. An example of a system that's not necessarily mission critical, that wouldn't necessarily come on the radar in a, in a formal risk assessment, um, is your social media pages, for example. That has a very high intrinsic value, and it's often put by the wayside and not considered important because it doesn't have a lot of monetary value. It's not important for business continuity, for disaster recovery. So we tend to care about it less when we're putting in the numbers into the formula. So next, broken windows theory. Well, this was introduced in 1982 by uh, Welling in the Atlantic Monthly, and it was introduced uh, via a story that I'll paraphrase. Uh, essentially, uh, in central Wisconsin, of course, uh, the paper industry has been far more important uh, in previous years than it is recently, so a lot of factories are closing down. So if we consider a factory that has closed operations and moves away, moves back to whatever country they came from. So in the community, uh, this factory, which was once, of course, the center of uh, a great economic benefit to them, it meant a lot to them, a lot of people worked there, is now abandoned. So the community slowly begins to see it as abandoned. Well, one day, for whatever reason, let's say there's a bad storm and a window breaks, and the community waits and watches to see if the window gets fixed, and it doesn't. Apparently, there is no capable guardian here. That signals the absence of a capable guardian. Well, one day, a kid in the neighborhood decides to throw a rock through a window, and we don't need to, we don't need to try and figure out why. Uh, breaking windows is fun, good enough. Well, breaking windows is also wrong and all of the other neighborhood, neighborhood kids know that. But nothing happens to that first kid. There's no apparent consequences. So the other kids in the neighborhood, throwing rocks at windows is fun. They start doing it too. And before long, we see signs of disorder encouraging further disorder. So broken windows theory can be summed up essentially as that a wrong, when gone unchallenged, encourages more wrongs. And there are a lot of factors that come into play here, sociological factors, social influence, and the absence of a capable guardian, which I could probably spend a whole other session talking about, but we'll just move on. So one of the best examples of computer crimes uh, that involve broken windows theory is intellectual property theft. Uh, these numbers are the most recent that I was able to find an official published study for, um, but uh, things have changed significantly since these numbers were published, so I guess keep that in mind. But uh, consider that uh, not that long ago, uh, at least 46% of Americans engaged in intellectual property theft in one way or another, either knowingly or unknowingly. So some people were 
um, purchasing cereals uh, that they thought were legitimate but actually weren't, um, or um, outright engaging in intellectual property theft via torrenting, whatever those happen to be. That's a lot of broken windows. That's a lot of broken windows out there. So what is the challenge to those wrongs? Uh, well, there wasn't very much. So if you were engaging in intellectual property theft, your ch odds of seeing some sort of legal recompense for that, not necessarily receiving a takedown request, but in a legal sense having repercussions for that, was about 0.007%. And if we remove films, the intellectual property category of films, which was the one most likely to generate some sort of legal, legal repercussion, it's even less, 0.001%. And we see that that has changed even significantly. 2017, of course, six strikes was decommissioned, so there's fewer takedown requests being seen. They're just changing tactic. They've stopped fighting. They're, they're, they're no longer trying to challenge those wrongs nearly as much. Um, so the reason for this, uh, again, a change in tactic. So other social factors, uh, for example, a change in the technology, peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing, uh, falling by the wayside in favor of stream ripping, um, the mainstreaming of uh, uh, privacy-enhancing technologies like VPN uh, coming into play, but also fixing the windows. Um, so piracy was at its highest when we saw content creators that had tried to have their own proprietary formats. So everybody, NBC, ABC, uh, Fox, HBO, all of them have their own proprietary media streaming formats. When those began to consolidate under two or three, your Netflix, your Hulu, your what have you, we saw piracy fall because people were willing to even pay for legitimate access to this content. We actually see piracy on the rise again as those are beginning to split off and content is now being distributed again against more streaming formats. Which brings us to our lessons. When it comes to your security efforts, repair the windows and challenge wrongs. Any sign of disorder within your organization, and disorder can not necessarily be uh, you know, uh, something that is a potential data breach, it could just be uh, consistent violations of company policy, which maybe uh, you know, you got a soft heart and you've let it slide for a while. Well, when you let something slide, you're giving something up there. You're not just, it's, company policy is a policy for a reason, and if there's no reason for a policy to exist, it probably shouldn't. So when you see that opportunity to um, address disorder, do so. Um, as far as fixing the windows go, uh, keep in mind, people circumvent policy and they break the law for a reason. They don't just break the law for the sake of doing it. There's a, there's a goal in mind. There's something that they want, something that they need to attain, so they go out of their way in order to break those rules. But if you provide them a legitimate avenue to that goal, they're much less likely to do that. So that's repairing the windows. Project the presence of a capable guardian and give people a way to achieve those goals. Now, if you don't, and there are some cases that you can't, keep in mind that you're going to be uh, expending even more resources policing the effort. You can't do one and not the other. If you have a policy that's going to be an imposition to people and you don't police that effort, it's useless. It will be broken regularly and eventually it will be ignored completely. And then you'll try to enforce it later and you'll find pushback. Well, this has never been the case. This is the first time I'm hearing of it. Jerry in accounting doesn't have to do that. Why do I? This is when you put yourself in that position. How often we have to sacrifice one for the other, that is naturally the compromise. But keep in mind to paraphrase, paraphrase uh, Henry David Thoreau, what did he say? He said, um, those who practice politics who fail to recognize uh, half measures um, put off payment while interest accrues or something like that. So just keep in mind that every compromise, unless it's for an objective to obtain a goal, you're going to be, you're just kicking the can down the road. You're going to be addressing it later. Uh, so the next and final theory that I have to talk about is general strain theory, which is a theory that pr describes particularly well the malicious inside actor, so an individual who has access to your systems, either as a course of doing their job, um, or in some cases just extraneous access that's sort of accumulated over the years, but an individual that does have authorization or did have authorization. So what makes somebody with that authorization cause them to abuse it, to violate policy, or to break the law? Uh, well, general strain theory attempts to describe that. So we have the concept first of goal blockage of a strain. So people who are, who are working, people who are living, will uh, accumulate a strain. It, it builds up. That comes from a number, number of different ways. So the failure to achieve their goals, a disjunction between what they expect to happen and what actually happens, uh, the removal of a positive stimuli from their life, or the presentation of a negative stimuli in their life. 
What this generates are negative feelings, your anger, frustration, disappointment, depression, all of these are negative emotions that will sooner or later, depending on the type of person they are, be alleviated or could be alleviated with criminal coping or antisocial personality disorder. We could spend a lot of time talking about general strain theory and bringing up Robert Merton's um, deviance typology to talk about different individuals and different categories and how they react to strain. Um, but uh, suffice to say that depending on the kind of person it is, their reaction to strain may be more pronounced than others and it may come sooner than others. So talking about the different types of strain, we've got goal blockage and the disjunction of expectations from reality. And what we're talking about here uh, is essentially a violation of the subject's sense of justice. They feel as if, through the course of their position, have been wronged in some way. So we may see individuals, uh, perhaps, uh, who uh, they, they've been denied a promotion. Um, they, they don't, they're not being paid what they feel like they deserved. Um, they expected, you know, at the age that they are, after working this many years, to be a manager, but they're not. Um, for whatever reason, maybe, maybe they don't see their supervisor as being uh, as capable as they are. Well, we may see that individual react, gain those negative feelings, and engage in criminal coping as a result, which we saw in 2018 with the Tesla leak, where an employee leaked sensitive and proprietary information from a, uh, to a competitor uh, because they had been passed up for a promotion. Uh, next, the presentation of noxious stimuli or the loss of positive stimuli results in a feeling of a loss of uh, privilege, a loss of position, a loss of value uh, in, in their appointment. So it's either something bad has happened or something good that they once had were taken away. So if you have a system administrator that's very overworked, uh, maybe oversees a lot of different systems, well, it may be good business sense to pull something away from them and give it to somebody else so that they have more time to focus on their other critical systems. That's logical, but people don't always react in logical ways, and this may result in that system administrator feeling like they are being demoted or something is being taken away from them, which can cause real problems and result in those negative feelings and antisocial behavior. Um, the presentation of a noxious stimuli would be, for example, a disciplinary hearing or a change in job title even, maybe something that's not necessarily positive or negative, but their position has changed. Their current system is being decommissioned, they're being re reclassified somewhere else. These, these are changes, and if a change is unexpected or unwanted, um, it can result in these negative feelings. We see this as an example, the uh, 2014 Morrison leak, where one of their employees, Andrew Skelton, um, leaked the employee database after uh, a disciplinary hearing. He had been censured by the company for using the company mailroom to send and receive items on eBay, uh, which they took exception to. Uh, so a final note on theories before I'm done here today. Uh, the um, most important thing to understand when applying uh, sociology to your environment is, uh, or rather criminological theories, I should say, is there is no one unifying theory of crime. There's no one theory that explains everything. Some theories apply better in some situations than others. Um, often multiple theories can be applied to better explain any kind of situation. Um, but. Uh, for example, we can say that an individual who's working under strain, that's general strain theory, who frequently sees company policy violations and nothing happens to them, we've got broken windows theory, that individual is far more likely to engage in deviant or criminal behavior uh, if the opportunity presents itself with routine activities theory in a place where they can be disassociated from their identity, where they have some sort of insulation from their identity, and it's uh, so, uh, space transition theory. Um, so lastly, my contact information. Uh, I have obviously a lot to say on this subject that I don't have time to today. If you are interested in this at all, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to, uh, to talk about this anytime. Um, and I guess that's all I have today. I guess I have time for questions, if anybody has any. I wouldn't say that there's ever really a time when it's too late to address these issues. If you have signs of disorder, as long as it's still, you're still in a place where it is feasible uh, to address those problems, then certainly there's always time to do that. If you find yourself in a situation where you're so far behind that signs of disorder have taken over, there's, there's always an opportunity or a time when it becomes clear that it's time to start over, right? Clean house, as it were. Anybody else? Okay, great. Thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate it.